This podcast is sponsored by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Welcome to Permission to Speak, the video blog and podcast that loiters at the intersection of leaders who want their people to speak up, technology that facilitates connections, and results that serve our higher purpose. Now, here's your host, Kelly Vandiver. Hi, welcome to the podcast. My name is Kelly Vandiver, and my special guest today is Colonel Jill Morgenthal. Colonel Jill Morgenthal is a woman of many firsts. She was one of the first women to enter an experimental class for women in the U.S. Army ROTC and to train as an equal with men. She was the first woman battalion commander in the 88th Regional Support Command Division, the first brigade commander in the 84th Division, and then rose to the rank of colonel. She was also the first woman to run Homeland Security for the state of Illinois. During her military career, Jill Colonel Jill led hundreds of men and women around the world and was the recipient of the Bronze Star and the Legion of Merit for her lifelong leadership. Her unique experiences range from a showdown with Saddam Hussein to saving an American engineer from a Soviet kidnapping. Now retired, Colonel Jill teaches others about leadership as a professional speaker and the author of the highly acclaimed book, The Courage to Take Command, Leadership Lessons from a Military Trailblazer. And if you haven't seen it yet, be sure to watch your popular TED Talk, Fake It Till You Make It. <laughs> Welcome, Colonel Jill, to the podcast. Thank you so much. Now, as you know, we usually start by asking a couple quirky questions of our guests to get to know them a little bit as people. So my first quirky question for you is, what actor would you want to play you in a movie? Well, Kelly... <laughs> I uh, I have thought about this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I feel I look a little bit like Jodie Foster, although she's ah. very petite. <laughs> I think face wise, I think she could play a great Colonel Jill. Um, what you don't know is I do have a scriptwriter who is uh, thinking of optioning the book. And we have actually discussed who should be playing me. And some of the discussions are Reese Witherspoon or and then younger actresses. So who knows? But uh, it's exciting times. Very cool. Very not many of us would be able to answer that question with uh, <laughs> we've actually been talking about that. So <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. I, I could also see uh, Meryl Streep, but maybe just because oh, she's yes. my favorite actress. So uh, Oh, my gosh. What a superb yeah. actress. Yeah. And her daughter, Mimi. She, they could play young and older. Jill. There you go. Okay, so if they're listening, if they're listening, <laughs> very, very cool, very cool. All right. Uh, well, tell us something surprising about yourself that most people don't know. Well, you know, having been a colonel, uh, there's people make assumptions about who you are, and one thing people don't know is that for one of my relaxations, I actually love to bake cheesecakes, especially cheesecakes with liqueurs. And when I was a captain in Berlin, uh, the German American Club had this contest to be the, between the Germans and the Americans on baking. So I entered a uh, chocolate rum cheesecake, and. Uh, when they called the winner up, me, first of all, they were shocked because they thought Hopmon Morgenthaler would be a male. Um, <laughs> and so when I came up, they were shocked to see me. And then when I asked for, could I have the rest of the cake back to share with my friends, the three judges confessed that they had eaten it all. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so I guess I can say I'm an international blue ribbon winner <laughs> very cool very cool yes and i do know having been a woman in the military myself that do pe people do make assumptions so i could see that but uh wow that's that's very cool that's very cool um i, I i've only ever eaten a cheesecake once that had some liqueur well actually it was um a margarita cheesecake Ooh. and they brought it at lunch you know at work and i'm embarrassed to say it had a little bit of an effect on me in the <laughs> afternoon i did not realize that the liquor wouldn't really uh wouldn't really evaporate like in other cooked foods. <laughs> you probably needed a nap. I, I did. I did. I was I was very happy afterwards. <laughs> All right. Um, and now for something a little more serious. Um, so tell us what what is your story? What happened in your life that got you to a place where you decided to be a trailblazer, to be one of the first women to earn a regular commission in the army? 
Well, I was raised by bo- by two parents who really wanted me or encouraged me to go non-traditional. So this is in the 60s and 70s. And my mother had an um, honors degree from college, but she ended up being a military wife with four kids. So my mother was especially encouraging me to uh, try the non-traditional fields. And I actually didn't think of the military, even though my father was a Marine officer, because in my 18 years of growing up, I'd met only one Marine woman, and her name was Bunny. And I remember being a sixth grader looking at her like, Bunny? Bunny, you're not helping the cause here. Because <laughs> I was just a feminist prob- probably from day one. Um, but my father was at the Pentagon when I was in high school, and I had been um, I had decided on Penn State. And he came home one evening and he told me the Army was going to have an experiment. They're going to have 10 universities try ROTC with women and men training together. And I, I looked at him and I said, you mean I can be like you when I grow up? And he's like, yes. And it's like, wow, fantastic. And so I was in that experimental class in 1972, uh, the first time they ever trained women and men together. And so I... I don't know that I considered myself a trailblazer per se. I was just ex- so excited to be able to do, to follow my father. I mean, I am so my father's daughter, personality and everything. So, it, it, you know, the experiment sometimes was exhausting because I knew I knew I represented all women, even if I didn't want to. If I failed, all women failed. Yeah. So I had to overachieve. And I mean, it made me work harder than probably I w- someone else would have gotten out of me just because I did understand if I can't do this, then they're going to mark all women as can't do this. Well, and that's uh, one of the reasons why I was interested in, in talking with you. Um, and, 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 and there's fewer and fewer first, I think, um, yeah. as, as time goes on, whether it's uh, race barriers or uh, gender uh, type roles. Um, but, the the whole um, one of the purposes of this uh, podcast is to help leaders be better leaders and the idea of how do we give a voice to somebody who is um, new to this kind of a role or that is blazing a trail as it were so I, I was curious about some of the leaders that that you worked under as you were uh, blazing this this trail so um, I, I guess. Um, what was the climate like when uh, when you f- were part of this experiment when you first became commissioned as an officer were, were people wanting to get feedback from you on how it was going or <laughs> no <laughs> in fact it's funny um when i wrote my book and mcgraw hill uh rejected the first manuscript because i didn't put how i felt and I thought, whoa, the military never wanted to know how I felt. <laughs> so I had to actually go back to each story and go, how did I feel? Um, but I did luck out. Uh, first of all, um, at Penn State, the ROTC there, uh, the officers and enlisted were there to help us succeed. And when I headed off to boot camp that summer, for the officer boot camp, I got a great drill sergeant. There were there were only 83 of us women out on Fort Bragg of 50,000 men, and most of the men really came after us. I mean, very vicious with their comments and the things we saw and the humiliation, et cetera. Fortunately, my father had warned me about this. Um, but I had a great drill sergeant, and he made sure – he watched out for me as much as he did for the men. And that really taught me you leave no one behind. You don't make assumptions on people's character by their gender or their color. He was African-American who had actually made it to captain in the Vietnam War and then was demoted because he wanted to stay in Army after Vietnam. And it's like what a role model. I mean such dedication to the Army. Uh, so that's where I was fortunate. Uh, most of my career, I worked for men who wanted me to succeed, to be my very best. Every now and then, I came across the man who was furious that I was there, would try and shut me down. Uh, oh, let me share one story with you. I was over in Thailand. I was a captain. I knew I was promotable to major, but I was still a captain. And this one colonel, Special Forces, was furious that I, Army Reserve, 
and a woman there and I was the only woman and he would he just kept trying to shove me in a corner and I kept popping out because I just can't sit in a corner and I kept reminding myself that my colonel sent me there for a reason um, but so one day we're all sitting and then all of a sudden a four-star general showed up and we jumped to attention and the four-star general looks at my name Morgenthaler and he goes Captain Morgenthaler you related to Wendell Morgenthaler Yes, sir, my father. Oh, he's my instructor at the Naval War College. He is so proud of you. We just had dinner last week, you know, and and the general left. And right after that, the one-star general above the colonel brought me in, had me brief what I was doing, and all of a sudden, these obstacles were out of my way. And I did call my dad, and I said, thank you, dad. That's the only man you ever had to know in the Army for me. <laughs> I'm a Marine. Um, but, you know... And it was, it just made my life easier there because it was hell for several weeks until this general just walked through and acknowledged me. Um, but yeah, so every now and then I, often my peers were very threatened by a woman uh, because we were going to work harder as we knew we had to, which meant they had to work harder. And then a lot of the subordinates didn't want to salute a skirt, you know. And sorry, not an option. Right. You will salute the officer. And that's what I remember telling one man. I don't care how you treat women. I care how you treat Army officers. And he then snapped to attention with that. Nice. I wish I had had that line. I, I do remember having to <laughs> to uh, call down a sailor or two who didn't, like, <laughs> salute. I'm like, do you not salute officers? You know, type of thing. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it, it no, it really helped having a Marine officer. I mean, that did make it easier for me because a lot of women who came in with me had no role models. And I, at least, having watched my father, I knew when people crossed the line. And I remember young women, other women going, how do you know this? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and later on, it's like, oh, I'm a sponge. I got it from my dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my father was prior military or was um, retired military as well. So uh, he was a chief in the Navy. So I, I, oh, I picked up a few things too. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, were there things that um, – so you you said you were fortunate enough to work for really some really good leaders that wanted to help you succeed and and bring out the best. Were there uh, any uh, and you don't have to name names, but uh, are there things that were there things that some of the weaker leaders were doing that maybe even unintentionally they were doing that um, had a negative impact on uh, that they weren't anticipating? I don't know if that's a fair question, but oh. No, I. there were definitely uh, leaders who did not embrace what the military was doing. Uh, there were, and of course, I met one or two very insecure leaders, too. And that's pretty hard to work. I mean, they would say to me, why are you so confident? And it's like, you really want the opposite. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, one disappointment I had was a woman officer when I was over in Korea there were only three of us women officers at I Corps two, two other second lieutenants who kind of bonded so I was out there on my own and then one day a, a, a major um, was transferred in she had been a whack and I thought oh cool I'll go meet her she'll be my mentor and so I went to introduce myself and she said I got here on my own I'm not here to help you and I thought, whoa, wait a minute, you know, having been the daughter of a Marine, I know nobody gets there on their own. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, but the good news that came out of that, that made me more dedicated to look out for other women, to actually go to them and say, hey, would you like a mentor? Uh, can I help you with your career? So, you know, good came out of her insecurities on that one. Um, I... I worked when I was a full colonel in Iraq. You know, I go to Iraq, not too many people outrank me. I thought this is going to be, hey, this is going to be okay. Well, unfortunately, I worked for a very, um, worked with a very miserable general officer. Um, the Pentagon had warned me before I went that he was not a nice man. That, that is so the understatement. <laughs> He, he just loved chewing up and spitting out people. He loved making fun of people. It wasn't just me. It wasn't about my gender. He just went after everybody. And um, I just remember one day um, 
I did an interview with the New York Times on this complicated of command thing and he called me into his office and he told me I got it all wrong how stupid I was and he picks up the phone he calls this uh, other colonel he says get down here I want to tell you how stupid Morgenthaler is and so the colonel comes down and the general lays it out and the colonel goes yes sir she got it right and of course he just lost it well why doesn't anyone tell me this and i wanted to say because nobody wants to talk to you yeah no <laughs> kidding <laughs> that's what happens when you're not a good leader yeah um and he was the type literally you know how, how you said your truth he would literally have us standing up against the wall at attention at the morning briefing while he ate breakfast and i just thought where did he come from? And I Googled him and found out his father was like a four-star general, and he himself had been relieved of a command. And I thought, okay, so your career is going nowhere. You're nowhere close to dad. This is about you. This mm -hmm. isn't about me. So every time he'd rip into me, i just look at him and go, think, hmm, this is about you. And I wish I had had that attitude when I was young because I was very sensitive, and I, I would just take all these things people would say to heart and it would hurt and I'd lose sleep and finally it's like oh this is about you not about me yeah okay yeah, yeah. so boy if listeners out there when someone goes after you and they're ugly it is about them absolutely absolutely well I'm not sure why it takes us so long to learn that yeah. lesson but it's so true so true definitely so with the with the leaders that um uh you worked with whether some of the bad ones or or some of the good ones um what did that teach you that that you then um applied yourself as a leader well i was um i had several commanders really um push me out of my comfort zone uh you know in my fake it till you make it uh ted talk i talk about being a second lieutenant and being put up and commanding along the dmz when it looked like we were going to war and women, they kept pulling us out of combat training. Oh, women are never in war. <laughs> Here I am at the DMZ. And, but, but my commander had full faith when he sent me up there. I didn't have any faith in myself being able to do this, but he did. Uh, and then years later, I was um, a major and a battalion command came open and one colonel came up to me and said you know colonel morgan a uh, major morgenthaler you should apply for this and i said sir i don't think i'm ready and he said i don't care what you think the army will decide if you're ready apply for it and i got it it was one of the best commands i had and i would have lost totally lost the whole opportunity if i hadn't taken it then and so that's what i love about the military is they they kick you up whether you're ready or not the next step they give you the education. They've got the professional support. You know, as you know, our NCOs are there to train officers. Sometimes arrogant officers don't realize it, but they are there to watch our backs. And that's what happened in Korea is those NCOs up on the DMZ taught me, taught me how to lead. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. That's great. I, and I sometimes think that the civilian world misses out on that. You know, not yes. having had the the non commissioned officers to, you don't always listen to the folks beneath you, and I think that's part of one of my goals is is a <laughs> with this podcast is helping leaders to really listen, and and that's why it's called permission to speak. The the importance of that, and I saw it work in my own career as well. So, um, I I, we, we, I could talk all day about <laughs> your 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 career. Um, and and I, I think that there might be some people listening who um, are, are trailblazers themselves. Maybe they're finding themselves in a role where they haven't seen people that look like them in, in those kinds mm -hmm. of roles. Um, what advice do you have for those the the new generation of trailblazers out there? You have to accept the fact that. Um, if you are different from everyone else and you're the first, everyone is watching you and you do represent far more than just yourself. You re represent your gender or your race or your preference or your orientation and you have to therefore be on your top game all the time. You know what? You can go home and cry in the bathroom or go take a walk. But when you are in your organization, you're up front. 
you've just got to be on your game. Um, and it can be very exhausting. It can be very lonely. And yet at the end, I mean, it's so rewarding. I, I'm just proud of, I'm proud of what I accomplished and I'm proud of the, the women and men I've been able to help. And the cool thing is I, I do have people, both genders, all races asking for me to mentor. And I, I believe karma what you send out is what you come back comes back so you should send out good and so you should help others because eventually they might be the one helping you um but yeah you just got to be on that a game every day that's so i um uh, part of me wanted to to know how much the um the leadership the good leaders that you did have and that trusted you and have confidence in you how how much of an impact did that have i mean you obviously had to you were a strong woman to begin with and and willing to know that you had to put your game out there more than the next guy maybe did um but what kind of influence did the leaders uh make in the in the shaping of of you as a leader um what I liked and what I saw were I had um, – when I went to Germany, I was commanding over there too, and I had a fabulous commander. And I never felt like he ever looked at any of us as men or women. He actually had several women commanders um, and men. That was the first time I did not feel alone, that there were other people, I, women I could actually reach out to and say, hey, what's happening with you? This is happening to me. Um, I had a fantastic uh, company commander when I was executive officer, and he would give me the opportunity to lead. He would step away. He would send me to represent him, um, which was fabulous. I loved it, and I'd be really nervous, but it just showed the trust, and it and he let me make mistakes too. I mean, if I made a mistake, he called me in, let me know what I did wrong, and I didn't make that mistake again, and it was never held against me. Um, so. Uh, really good military leaders and good leaders let people take rest, risks. Let's let them fall because often that's when you learn the most is when you're picking yourself back up, and that's what I had. And when and the army understands that they they even tell us as lieutenants, especially, you know, this is your time to really blow it. <laughs> <laughs> The higher rank you get up, the less there will be of that opportunity. And and then that's a really good attitude, uh, right. that room to make a mistake, but to own up to it, too. I mean, that's one thing the military and the leaders taught me is you do take responsibility for your mistake. You do acknowledge it, and then you fix it. Um, the other thing I'd say the great leaders did is if I had a problem, I brought it to them, I better bring a solution. It might be not might not be the one they're going to use, but that you do not walk in without a solution. And boy, that teaches creativity and problem solving before you even go to the boss. Nice. Very good. Good advice for anybody in any role. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. So in your TED Talk, you mentioned that there was a gap um, the, the, you, you quoted some research of when people, the average age of when people become a manager and when they get management or leadership training. Uh, do you remember that statistic? Yes. Uh, um, Jack, Jack Zanger of um, Harvard Business Review did uh, research, and he found that the average American becomes a leader in a corporation around the age of 30, 31, but does not receive um, professional training as a leader until 40, 41. So you're talking a nine to 10 year gap between the time you got the responsibilities and the time you're given the training you need. And that's one reason why I decided to become a professional speaker because having been in ROTC, I was trained since the age of 18 to lead. And I realized, oh my gosh, I've got all this knowledge and experience. Let me help fill that gap. Um, because obvi obviously it's there. And I do meet a lot of really smart technical people, and they tell me one day they're just doing the job, and the next day they're in charge of the team. And they're just sitting there like, uh, where's leadership for dummies? I mean, how do I do this? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you talk about fake it till you make it in your, in your, in your TED Talk. Do you want to share some of those lessons uh, with our audience here? Sure. That was a piece of advice my father gave me as I headed off to boot camp that summer. He basically, he said, Jilly Bear, just fake it till you make it. 
and you know, leadership trait because you never know what life's going to throw at you. So you've got to be able to say, I can fake it. I can figure this out and make it. And so some of the things, of course, is to find that mentor, the one who can help you, um, who can give you that wise advice and possibly champion you too. Uh, another one, of course, is education. There's so much online um, that you can reach out to. And I would say, and this one I'm not sh- sure was in my TED Talks, a lot of it is is first showing respect to your team and acknowledging all the gifts and skills they bring and acknowledging what you lack. And sometimes, you know, you need to know what you have, but you need to know what you don't. So that you can turn to your team and say, look, I'm really good at this. I am not good at this. And that's why you're here. And that is is when you put that respect out, the respect comes. And when the respect comes, they're also watching your back as you watch their back. And so to me, that's one of the most important things for about faking it till you make it. Just be honest about Mm. it. Hey, this is new. Um, But help me. Nice, nice. Great advice. Great advice. Excellent. So um, on this uh, leadership journey, you've been on for a a number of, we're on for a number of years um, and still teaching leaders. Um, What have been one or two pleasant surprises along the way for you? Um, One time I was over in Iraq uh, and I went over to another uh, base and a base camp. I walked into the mess hall and they called everyone to attention. And I'm looking around for the general and realized, <laughs> oh, it's me, the colonel. So I'm like, um, at ease as you were. I'll be here in the area for a while. But I, I saw some young women lieutenants and I, I did that colonel thing. At, and where'd you get your commissioning? What are you doing now? And we just had a nice talk. And as I got up to leave, one young lady said, thank you, ma'am. I'm going to stay in. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, I was going to get out. I didn't think you could be feminine and a successful leader, too. And I'm like, oh, yes. And I'm just so glad I was meant to sit there that day. And and, And I'm so glad she shared with me, too. And so one of the things, just as I always wore lipstick because <laughs> with my short hair, I look like a boy in uniform. <laughs> so I always wore lipstick because it's like I am a woman leader. You know, not woman, not leader, woman leader. I am. Um, so th- that was a wonderful surprise. Um, th- the one day I realized I was a leader. We were preparing to go to Bosnia. I was at home. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I sat up and I thought, how am I going to keep private such and such alive? We had this one soldier. He couldn't march. He couldn't shoot. I, I finally, one day, I just asked him, I said, why are you in the Army? And he said, oh, my parents think it, think it's good for me. And I'm like, oh, okay. But And I sat up in the middle of the night, and I realized, oh, my gosh, I have to keep him alive. And then I, my second thought was, oh, my gosh, I am a leader. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Well, um, uh, part of me is really tempted to ask you to tell us more of those stories. So, I, you know, there was the story of uh, oh. Saddam Hussein and the story of uh, – um, the my the, Soviet yeah yeah yes, um, the Soviet plot. do you mind if we ask you those stories oh not at all I mean you put the teaser out there <laughs> good 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 in fact yeah when I, when I go on stage I always tell the Saddam Hussein story because oh my gosh uh, I had never expected to meet one of the most evil men in my whole life and if I hadn't stuck with the army I never would have had such a unique <laughs> Um, experience. So I'm over in Iraq. I'm actually running all the public affairs for the four-star commanding general, General Sanchez. And Saddam Hussein had already been captured in 2003. Well, in 2004, it's time for him to go before a judge on his crimes against humanity. And it's my job to get the international media into the courtroom to capture this first hearing. And, um, it's funny, the the night before, I was in the green zone working in the palace, and I got a call from the State Department, and that's strange because the State Department doesn't deal with colonels. They deal with generals. Mm-hmm. But this gentleman asked for me, and he said to me, um, Colonel Morgenthaler, uh, tomorrow when you're with Saddam Hussein, which sounded very, very strange, um, according to Condi, we would like you in civilian clothes and no weapon. I'm like, 
excuse me, I am in Iraq. This is he said yes, but according to Condi, and I went, wait a minute, I don't know this acronym. What is a Condi? And he goes, Colonel Morgenthaler, according to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, we're downplaying. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. Right then I'm standing at attention now at my desk. We're downplaying the role of the U.S. military as we position to the Iraqi government. So could you be in civilian clothes? So yes. And all I had was this long sleeve blouse, a long skirt, and combat boots. <laughs> <laughs> So I am hardly any idea, uh, anyone's vision of a model on the front of Vogue. <laughs> so um, I get all the media into the courtroom the next day. I'm hanging outside. There's no room for me. And a school bus pulls up and Saddam Hussein gets off the school bus with his guards. He is speaking in such fear. He doesn't even see me. And I realize he thinks he's going to die. He's going to get executed and die today because that's what he did. And I thought, ooh, this will be interesting. So then he's in the courtroom, and I'm trying to eavesdrop now. And eventually he does realize he's not dying, and he starts yelling and screaming at the judge, the young Iraqi judge. He's going to kill him. He's wiping out everybody in the courtroom. He's coming back. And the judge kicks him out. And when he walks out, he sees me standing there in this, you know, my civilian clothes, you know, a blonde woman in Iraq in civilian clothes. And he stops and he checks me out. He's, he's stripping me to my Victoria's secrets. And I'm like, oh, dude, you don't know I'm a colonel. I know I'm a colonel. And I just looked at him and I just thought, oh, just bring it on. And he stepped back and he barked out something in Arabic and the guards burst out laughing. And I'm like, what did he say? Kill her. What? He used to kill people for staring at him. And it's like, well, not this American soldier. Dude. Wow. Uh, wow. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's like, wow. Who would ever, you know, and I'll share another story. This one isn't, I don't think this one's in my book, but I also met Chemical Ali, the general who had dropped all the gas bombs on the Iraqi Kurds, killing 100,000 people. So he's this little guy, and I'm there in the hallway, and the guards bring him out from his hearing, and they take him into the bathroom, and the, and and Chemical Ali starts screaming, and I'm like, oh, my God, what are they doing to him? Should I get involved? What's going on? And then the guards come out looking disgusted, bringing him along, and I'm like, um, guys, what just happened in there? And they're like, oh, we had to give him his insulin shot. Every time we give him a shot, he thinks he's going to die. And I'm like, oh, oh good. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Karma. Karma. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Wow. So it's like, oh, now I've met two of the most evil. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Um, and then back to Berlin. Um, when I was in Germany, uh, as a captain, I was transferred up to Berlin to command a unit there. And uh, 1980, times were really tense. Uh, we'd beaten the Soviets in ice hockey, and they were not happy. Um uh, we were boycotting the Moscow Olympics, so they were not happy. And the reason was is they had invaded Afghanistan, and we weren't happy. And I was in intelligence, and I was watching us once again ratchet towards war. You know, once again, the women aren't in combat. Here I am, totally surrounded by the communists, East Germany, Polish, the Soviets. And it was very nerve-wracking then because I had heard the horrible stories of what the Soviets had done to the German women. And I'm like, I, I can't decide. Is it better to be dead than a prisoner? You know, and those are the kind of thoughts yeah. going through my head. Um, but every day I'd go home at lunch, have a sandwich. And one day I, I came out and, I, and sitting on the stoop was a captain in the infantry and a lieutenant who ran the post office. So I sat between the two guys and I'm like, hey, guys, what's happening? And the lieutenant who ran the post office said, Hey, you need any Soviet souvenirs? Well, when we used to go through Checkpoint Charlie or the other checkpoints, if you left a Playboy on your windshield, the Soviets would take it and give you a belt buckle. And I said, I don't need a belt buckle. I mean, how many Playboys till I'm a pervert? And he puffed up and he's like, oh, I'm not talking about belt buckles. I can get you Soviet Russian uniforms. 
and right then my military intelligence education and my mother kicked in which both taught me when something is too good to be true it is too good to be true and i thought what do the soviets think they're going to get from him he sells stamps so I turned on the charm, and I just said, oh, you can't get me Soviet uniform. Oh, yes, I can. I go, well, I don't need a Soviet uniform. What else can you get me? I can get you fur hats and fur coats. Whoa, now you're talking. What else? I can get you antiquities from Greece and Turkey. Really, what else? I can get you wined and dined in East Berlin to the opera, the symphony. And the whole time I'm trying to figure this out. What do the Soviets want from him? So I'm just nudging him and nudging him. And finally, he's running out of things. He goes, well, Soviets are going to give my brother a tour of Eastern Europe. Cool. What does your brother do? Oh, he's a satellite engineer in California. Oh, bingo. So I said, well, you know what? Look what time it is. I've got to go back to work, but I'll see you later. And then as soon as I got out of sight, I ran up to the command headquarters. I burst into the colonel who ran operations security, and I went, Sir, you're not going to believe what the Soviets are going to do. He's like, Captain Morgenthaler, could you calm down? What are they doing? (laughs) Yes, now, well, sir, they're going to kidnap an American satellite engineer. What? The next thing, military intelligence swept up to the lieutenant to keep him safe, and uh, FBI swept up to his brother to keep him safe. And I couldn't tell this story for 30 years. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Finally, at 30 years and probably one day, I turned to my family. I said, have I ever told you <laughs> about this Soviet plot? And after I told the story, my son went, Mom, you saved the Western world. And I'm like, <laughs> I did. <laughs> Where is my big medal? <laughs> And and I realized I was the right person at the right time at the right place. The Soviets never factored in a senior woman officer flirting with this lieutenant, making him feel as good as they had made him feel. So swept it out from underneath their feet. Uh, So this is one reason why actually the screenwriter is uh, interested in my stories is – this could be part of it, you know, and, and I keep waiting for some day to knock on the door and some guy going, you ruined my career. Hey, let's talk about uh, the Hollywood deal. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 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 Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, if that's not inspiration to folks to <laughs> encourage trailblazing, I don't know. I don't know what is. So, Wow. Well, thank you so much, uh, Colonel Jill, for for sharing your stories and um, and and for the work that you're doing and in, and in inspiring the next generation of leaders. Um, oh, Kelly, thank you. Yeah. You too, very well, much. And as I as I mentioned to you, I I feel that I owe my military career to the women that came before me uh, that set the example, and I, I'd like to think that. Um, that I helped too. And that after um, we continued to set the kind of example that we did and do the great work that we did, that's why they opened up combat uh, roles to women. And, and, and I believe that. That's right. Oh, absolutely. You know, for every woman who's just stood there and did her job and did her job better and harder, you know, we've, we've, we've shown women can do it and women should do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, uh, Colonel Jill, for your time and for your sharing. And uh, um, thank you for your service. Thank you. Hua. <laughs> I was trained by a Marine, so hoorah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right this take care. podcast was brought to you by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Thanks for tuning in to Permission to Speak. If you want to increase collaboration and innovation in your organization, check out more resources available at speakingpractically.com or give me a call, Kelly Vandiver, at 770-597-1108.